in the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. Amen. God our Father, may we climb with Jesus the mountain of prayer and contemplate his face full of love and truth. May we be filled with his light to guide us on the journey of faith and to help us to live out our prayerful experiences. We make our prayer through Christ our Lord. Amen. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. My dear brothers and sisters in Christ, on our second Sunday of Lent, we are reflecting on the transfiguration of our Lord. Mark chapter 9. Verses 2 to 10. Jesus takes up Peter, James, and John to the mountain by themselves. There, his countenance is altered, and his garments shine with a blinding light. At his side appear Moses and Elijah speaking with him. And Peter said, Master, it is good for us to be here. And let us make three shelters, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. And while he was speaking, there came a cloud that overshadowed them. And out of the cloud came a voice saying, This is my beloved son. Listen to him. And when they looked around, they saw no one but Jesus. My dear brothers and sisters in Christ, contextualizing our pericope for our catechesis today, we note that the story of the transfiguration is set against the identity of Jesus. Prior, Jesus had asked the disciples, Who do the multitudes say that I am? The disciples answered him, John the baptizer. But others said, Elijah, and others that one of the old prophets that has risen again. But Jesus once more asked them, but who do you say that I am? It was Peter who answered, You are the Christ. Mark chapter 8, verses 27 to 30. My dear answer says in Christ, The answer of Peter that you are the Christ was correct. However, it was mad with political and military overtones. It was held that the dawn of a messiah would usurp political and military power from the Romans. However, Jesus clarifies the implication of Peter's profession by describing the process by which he himself who accomplished his messiahship. On the contrary, he will accomplish his mission through suffering, death, and resurrection. He says he is destined to suffer grievously, to be rejected by the elders, chief priests, and scribes, and be put to death on the third day rise again. Mark chapter 8 verses 31 to 33. Such a qualification did not sit well with the disciples and Peter even tried to rebuke Jesus but Jesus could not budge. Therefore, the transfiguration is not only a foreshadow of his glory, but also an attestation of his identity. 
the voice that comes in the cloud attests by saying that this is my beloved son. Listen to him. This is my beloved son. Listen to him. My dear brothers and sisters in Christ, let us now revert to our text for further reflections. The text reads in part, Six days later, Jesus took with him Peter and James and John and led them up a high mountain apart by themselves. And he was transfigured before them. And his clothes became dazzling bright, such as no one on earth could brighten them. Mark chapter 9, verses 2 and 3. My dear brothers and sisters in Christ, the allusion at the beginning of this verse links the transfiguration of our Lord to the preceding passage in which Peter declared that Jesus is the Christ and also Jesus' declaration that he must suffer and die. And all three of the Synoptic Gospels place the transfiguration immediately after Jesus' first passion prediction, emphasizing that the one who will be killed and on the third day be raised up is not a random victim of virus, but the Son of God carrying out God's plan. Mark chapter 9, verse 31. We also note that prior to our text of reflection, Jesus was with a larger group of disciples. However, he now selects a few that go with him. Thus, signaling the importance of the journey up the mountain. These three disciples, Peter, James, and John, would be considered as his inner circle. And these three were present at the healing of Jairus' daughter. The three some will also be present at the Garden of Gethsemane. My dear brothers and sisters in Christ, Jesus led them up a high mountain apart by themselves. This is more of a theological statement than geographical. To have a mountain top experience is not the same as mountain hiking, but to go up on a mountain to pray. Biblically speaking, mountains are places of prayer. And it is on mountains that many significant encounters with God takes place. High mountains are places where people encounter God. Moses, for that matter, encountered God on Sinai as a devouring fire on the top of the mountain. Exodus chapter 24, verse 17. Elijah fled to Mount Horeb, and there God spoke to him in a still small voice. 1 Kings chapter 19, verse 12. Jesus went up the mountain to call and appoint the twelve disciples. Mark chapter 3, verse 13. And to pray. And now the mountain top was transfigured. Jesus was transfigured before them. And his clothes became dazzling bright, such as no one on earth could brighten them. My dear brothers and sisters in Christ, the transfiguration revealed Jesus' true identity, an identity that he had from the beginning. Suddenly, 
The disciples are able to see Jesus' glory. The glory that Jesus always possessed. But that has been veiled until this moment. And truly, Jerusalem will be the place of his death. But it will also be the place of his resurrection. Events that will reveal his lasting glory. The transfiguration, therefore, Give the three a privilege of the glory of Jesus Christ. And there appeared to them Elijah and Moses who are talking with Jesus. Moses and Elijah epitomized the law and the prophets. Both Moses and Elijah had received the revelation on mountain tops. Moses received the Ten Commandments on Mount Sinai. Exodus chapter 20, verses 1 to 17. Moses died and was buried. However, no one knows the place of his burial. Deuteronomy chapter 34, verse 8. Moses is one of the few to have experienced a visual encounter with Yahweh. Exodus chapter 34, verses 9, verses 6 to 9. So, intense that his face glow, afterwards that the Israelites could not look upon it. Elijah fled to Mount Horeb. And there God spoke to him in a still, small voice. 1 Kings chapter 19 verse 12. Elijah is said to have ascended into heaven in a whirlwind accompanied by a fairy chariot. 2 Kings chapter 2 verse 11. It is those two men who appear on the mountain of Jesus and his companions. Moses and Elijah have been on mountains to receive revelation. Thus, they are expected to appear at the coming of the Messianic age. Confer Deuteronomy chapter 18 verse 15. Malachi chapter 4 verse 5. Thus, the appearance of Moses and Elijah speaking with Jesus affirms the dawn of the messianic age. Already, Moses had prophesied, Your God will raise up to you a prophet from the midst of you, of your brothers like me. You shall listen to him. Deuteronomy chapter 18, verse 15. At this transfiguration, my dear brothers and sisters in Christ, God confirms that the new Moses-like prophet is Jesus, saying, this is my beloved son. Listen to him. Peter will also link the Moses' prophecy with Jesus in his sermon shortly after Pentecost. Confer Acts chapter 3, verse 22. My dear brothers and sisters in Christ, Moses came to set the people of Israel free from slavery in Egypt. And Jesus came to set people free from sin. The exodus from Egypt was the great salvation event of the Old Testament, freeing Israel from bondage to the Egyptians. However, Jesus' exodus through his death and resurrection is the great salvation event of the New Testament, freeing believers from the bondage of sin and death. The exodus from Egypt led God's people to the promised land. While Jesus' ex 
sold us, leads us into the kingdom of God. My dear brothers and sisters in Christ, Jesus had just announced to the disciples that he must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders, chief priests, and scribes, and be killed on the third day. And on the third, and be killed, and on the third day, be raised up. Mark chapter 8, verses 31 to 33. My dear brothers and sisters in Christ, when we look at all this, that is why Peter says to Jesus, Rabbi, it is good for us to be here. Let us set up three tents, one for you, one for me. And one for Elijah. Of course, he did not know what to say, for they were terrified. Mark chapter 9, verses 5 and 6. When we look closely on the Gospels, they don't tell us why Peter wants to build three tents. Peter is overwhelmed at being the company of the Messiah. And these two great men, he feels a need to do something to honor the occasion and perhaps to prolong the mountaintop experience or to keep Jesus safe on the mountain rather than seeing him exposed to suffering, rejection, and death. Perhaps this is the more reason why Peter was trying to rebuke Jesus. Now, because Jesus has not budged, he tries to offer this idea, let me build you tents, so that Jesus is not exposed to the suffering that he has spoken before, to the rejection that he has spoken before, and to the death that he had spoken before. But that was not to happen. His suggestion of building three tents or booths, such as those in which Jews dwell to observe the feast of booths or, or tabernacles, which commemorates the exodus and the wanderings of the Israelites in the wilderness, may have at the back of his mind, may be at the back of his mind. However, that idea did not materialize. The disciples were terrified because they understood the cloud as the presence of God. On the high priest is allowed to come into God's presence. And only on the day of atonement, to look into God's face is to die. Exodus chapter 33, verse 20. Who knows what will happen to them now that they are in God's presence? Perhaps they will die. Whatever the potential outcome, they feel unworthy. To stand in God's presence, unprepared for that matter to meet their maker, vulnerable in their state. It is as if they have been presented suddenly and without warning. They are afraid. However, a voice from the cross says, This is my chosen son. Listen to him. Meaning, Whatever that he has spoken about, take that to not and take that to your hearts. Listen and obey. The voice from the clouds echoes the voice from heaven at Jesus' baptism. You are my beloved son. In you are more pleased. However, these words are now directed at the disciples rather than Jesus. Listen to him. 
Jesus has told them that he will suffer and he die. They, they will also suffer and die. The disciples have ever expected Jesus to conquer and not to die. As a result, the disciples will neither listen attentively nor carry out their tasks faithfully until after the resurrection. They will fail to heal a boy with a dead one. They will fail to understand Jesus' warning about his betrayal. They will argue about which one of them is the greatest. They will not understand Jesus' prediction of his death and resurrection. And subsequently, Peter will deny Jesus. They will all stand at a distance, save for John, while Jesus was being crucified. But God will win the victory anyway. Then a cloud overshadowed them. And from the cloud there came a voice, This is my son, the beloved. Listen to him. Suddenly, when they looked around, they saw no one with them anymore but Jesus. My dear brothers and sisters in Christ, a cloud came overshadowing them. Throughout the scripture, clouds symbolize the presence of God, beginning with a pillar of cloud that led the Israelites through the wilderness by day. The most obvious parallel is the cloud that covered Mount Sinai when Moses ascended it. Exodus chapter 24, verse 15. Clouds are associated with the presence of the Lord in both New and Old Testaments. On the mountain of transfiguration, the cloud overshadows, overwhelms them. Later, at Jesus' ascension into heaven, a cloud will take Jesus out of their sight. And the most dramatic attestation of Jesus' identity comes with the voice of God out of the cloud. The basic message echoes the divine words spoken at Jesus' baptism, but they are notable differences. The message of Jesus' baptism was spoken directly to him. You are my son. But here, the message is for the disciples. This is my son. At baptism, the, the adjective describing Jesus' sonship was beloved. Again, a message directed at Jesus, but here it is chosen. Say the disciples. Describing Jesus' relationship to God from the disciples' perspective. The message of Jesus' sonship here is given an imperative implication. Listen to him. Jesus' sonship is not a matter of speculation, but requires the obedient response of the disciples of Jesus' message. Jesus' most recent teaching emphasized the costly demands made on those who would follow him. That is, denying themselves and taking up their cross. And that is surely the primary message meant to be listened to and obeyed. Whereas the voice at the baptism came from heaven, he it comes from the very cloud in which the disciples are already enveloped. This suggests a rather intense experience of God's close presence. This is again reminiscent of Moses' own experience of God's presence at Sinai, the most formative revelation of God in the history of Israel. This is my son, the beloved. Listen to him. This is equally reminiscent of Deuteronomy 
where Moses told the people of Israel, Yahweh, your God, who raised up to you a prophet from the midst of you, of your brothers like you. You shall listen, Shama, as they were coming down the mount. He ordered them to tell no one about what they had seen until after the Son of Man had risen from the dead. And so they kept the matter to themselves, questioning what this rising from the dead could mean. Mark chapter 9. Verses 9 and 10. My dear brothers and sisters in Christ, the disciples are commanded to tell no one how difficult it must have been for the three disciples to come down from the mountain top after experiencing the presence of Elijah and Moses and hearing the voice of God on the mountain top. It is necessary to descend into the everyday life of work, responsibility, and the ordinary people. God calls us back to our everyday life in the midst of the world, to live out our faith, to be beacons of faith. But he commands them to tell no one what they had seen until after his resurrection. There will be a time to speak and witness. This time is a time of introspection. Jesus invites us to a time of introspection and especially this Lenten season. Salient points for further reflections. The transfiguration of Jesus is a crucial point in the life and ministry of Jesus as it sums up his ministry and anticipates his death. From this point on, Jesus spoke plainly of his imminent death. He was sent towards Jerusalem. His glory was to come through suffering. Of course, this went against the popular expectation which was held by the people of Israel that the Messiah would come clothed in splendor and break the bones of the Romans, which was a materialistic concept of the kingdom. However, Jesus came first and foremost to redeem mankind from sin by dying on the cross the disciples could not put together the seemingly contradictory phrase of suffering and glory. Thus, the event of the transfiguration must have been a great consolation to the disciples because God attested to the identity of Jesus that this is my beloved son. Listen to him. The transfiguration of our Lord Jesus gives us a glimpse of the coming future glory of Christ at Easter. But it also reminds us that the way to Easter is through the cross. And God commands that we listen and emulate his chosen son. We listen to so many voices today, all of which seem smart attractive, articulative, and wise. Voices of specialists, voices of journalists, voices of commentators, voices of politicians, voices of celebrities, icons, ETC. All these promise us health, wealth, and happiness. But seldom do they live up to their promises. They often lead people towards ruin. The question that begs an answer is, is there any trustworthy voice amongst all these that we must listen to? The voice from the crowd says, 
that we can always trust Jesus. This is my son, my beloved. Listen to him. To live listening to Jesus is a unique experience because we'll be listening to someone who says the truth, someone who knows why and what to live for, someone who offers the key to build a more just and dignified world for humanity. The one who is truthful. The one who says the truth at all times. Jesus' followers don't live by just any belief. A community becomes Christian when it goes about putting the gospel at the center of its life. That is where our identity as Christians comes into play. My dear brothers and sisters in Christ, we may ask ourselves a question, how many broken hearts and broken lives could be avoided if we were listening to Jesus? Our world is dashing the poor against the rocks of despair, the rock of hunger, the rock of abandonment every day. The economic beast, controlled by a cartel, is making our people convulse day in, day out. The poor, the unemployed, the homeless, the sick, those surviving on meager wages. Unless we get out of the fortress of our worship spaces and rebuke the unclean spirits of the powers that be and shed light in the lives of the poor, of our communities, of our people who we'll never know the transfiguration. Glory will be an unknown world and a mirage experience. The spiritual journey is always a battle between falling asleep and staying awake, between absence and praise, between darkness and light. Sleepness is not simply a physical matter. It is also a spiritual issue and condition. Spiritual sleep is a form of blindness. It blinds us to the beauty and the holiness of the world, other people and ourselves. Blindness to God's praises in the world and the goodness of creation is what allows us to do violence to one another and ourselves. The three some experienced the transfiguration of Christ because they stayed at work despite all that was. They saw for the first time what has always been. They saw the light of divinity fully manifest in a human being, something a mirror they can never reveal. There are a thousand different things that weigh us down. Fear, exhaustion, bustle, distraction, boredom, avoidance of challenging situations, doing the same old things all the time. Regardless of what is weighing us down, we miss the glory of Christ, the transfigured reality of Christ Jesus amongst us. There is more to who you and I can ever become. There is in each and every one of us an unlived life waiting to be lived. There is hope during despair. There is need during suffering. There is courage during fear. There is peace in the midst of chaos. And there is life in the midst of death. In every season, my dear brothers and sisters in Christ, regardless of what it is, there is a light giving hope and an illumination offering insight and direction pointing the way. Let us God our Father, may our mountain experience with our Lord Jesus Christ in prayer 
accompany us with his light and guide us all on our journey of faith. Living out his love and truth. May our Lenten season be filled with moments of silent prayer and for listening to the word of God. We make our prayer through Christ our Lord. Amen. In the name of the Father, of the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. On this day, oh beautiful.